Amen. Praise the Lord. It's good to be in God's house once again. And um, we want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you tonight. God bless the reading of his word tonight. And we, we're just excited to be here. Amen. Pray if you don't see somebody here. Pray that you will, they will come. And it seems like sometimes people get a little bit lazy. But um, I know God's not lazy. He's always here. Praise the Lord. Amen. If you have your Bibles, open them up <clears throat> to the book of Acts, chapter 23. We're going to be starting with verse 12 tonight. Is that right? Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that you would bless your word. God, that you will speak to us tonight and help us, Lord, to understand your word. Father, we pray, God, that your Holy Spirit will begin to move and that, God, you will, by the power of your Holy Spirit, bring the book of Acts alive again, Father, in our church. In all the churches that are listening, that may Tune in, Father. We pray, God, that they get the Holy Ghost back and stop with all this other foolishness that's going on in the church. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We're going to be starting with verse 12 tonight. It says, And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse. Very interesting here. Or should say with an oath. They made an oath. But they were very famous about putting curses on themselves. Remember the story when Jesus was before Pilate and Pilate said, Whose blood shall this man be? And they said, Let it be on us and on our children. That was a curse. As terrible as the Holocaust was and as terrible as what the Jews have gone through, a lot of it was because of that curse. I believe that. Let his blood be on us and on our children. And I pray that the Lord will save them in the end times and bring the Jews back in, graft them back in, unless they stay in their unbelief and their blindness. You can speak curses on yourself. You can believe what people tell you. What are curses? Curses are words. It's a formulation of words. If you read anything in the, in the occult books and everything, you'll see that that's what it is. It's, a, it's a, called incantations. And what they are is they're words. They speak the words. So someone says to me, uh, someone says to you, you're stupid, you'll never amount to anything. If you believe that curse, it'll happen. Because the enemy will come, and now he has permission to come into your life and, and destroy your life, and have havoc. That's why when we don't do things God's way, and we do things our way, what did God tell Adam? You're cursed. By the sweat of your brow. When people go to work and they hate going to work every day, that's Adam. When a woman are having childbearing pains, and they're going through labor pains, that's part of the curse. You read Deuteronomy. I forget where it is in Deuteronomy. I don't know. Chapter 28, I think. It talks about the blessings and the curses. If you obey and do this, you'll, be, you'll have this and you'll be blessed and all this. But if you do this, you'll be cursed. Now, for the Christian, that's different. But for the unsaved, and they wonder why we're going through all kinds of problems and they think the government's the, the solution. The government's not the solution. The government has gotten God out of everything. It's getting God back into everything. And once we get God back into everything, then everything's going to turn out better. I get an amen somewhere? Okay, now I can hear you. Okay. They were bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. 
Now, I know there's a lot of people that don't believe in conspiracy theories. They say they're just made up, they're just make-believe, but they're not. Some of them are, many of them are, but there are conspiracies that people will come and plot something together, that's a conspiracy, and bring it to pass. They made an oath, they made a curse, and they said, we're not going to eat anything, and we're not going to drink anything until we kill Paul. I mean, that's pretty much determination. That someone wants to kill you that bad that they're not going to eat or drink until you're dead. So you can see and understand that the Jews now, there were certain Jews. Paul was a Jew. They consider him a traitor. They have such hatred for the Apostle Paul because he is, is deemed a traitor. And I, I've personally experienced that with a person who was Jewish. And I was talking with them and witnessing to them. And I mentioned the Apostle Paul, and you should have saw the hatred come on this person's face. I mean, literally, hatred. His eyes were turned red, and he, he says, oh, he's a traitor. So you can understand this kind of hatred, this kind of animosity of wanting the Apostle Paul dead with such intensity. And there were more than 40 which made this conspiracy. Imagine that. One, not if you have two or three or four, but you got 40? You know, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a conspiracy to try to take out the president of the United States. You've got all these actors promoting it. You've got people saying they want to blow up the White House, all this kind of stupid foolishness. And they don't understand that they're planting seeds in people's minds. People that may not be in their right mind. They're planting these seeds, thinking that God's going to tell them to do that. God's not going to tell them to do no such thing. And verse 14 says, And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Again, not only did they just keep it within the 40, but now they went out and told people, this is what our plan is. Now, how many know that's kind of stupid? If you want to carry out a plan, you want to keep it covert. You don't want to <laughs> overtly tell everybody because you know that somebody's always going to tell somebody something. Okay? You can go to a person and you can tell them, I'm going to tell you a secret. Don't tell anybody, right? What happens? Somehow that person slips out and tells somebody and says, well, I don't tell nobody. And that person's not obligated because they don't know this person. So they go out and tell somebody else. They go tell somebody. Before you know it, it comes back to you. Well, once it's out there, it's out there. And so here the Apostle Paul, he's got all these plots against him. And now they bring it out to the public, these... these um, Elders and priests. And then it says in verse 15, Now therefore ye with the council signify to the chief captain that he, meaning Paul, be brought down unto the tomorrow as though he would, we would inquire something of him more perfectly concerning him. And we are ever he come near are ready to kill him. So they already had the plot. They already had it all designed. They had it all strategically planned on how they were going to do this. In other words, what they're going to do is have Paul come into the assembly and they, like they were inquiring some more information against the charges against him. And when he would come be brought down, on the way being brought down, they would intercept him, take him, and kill him. Now, again, you have to understand that God's word says that our times and seasons are in his hands. And whether it's the Apostle Paul or it's yourself, you're not going to die until your fulfillment of what God has for your life. Unless you do something stupid. Right? Always obey the voice of God. 
When I was a little boy, I think I told you the story, we went to go be, play behind U.S. furniture, and there was a little uh, quarry there with water. And I was maybe nine, nine years old, eight years old, and um, went back there, and a bunch of kids were on a raft, and they were playing pirates and all that stuff. And the kid that I went with said, come on, let's go play pirates. And I went to go, and a voice told me, don't go. And I didn't go. And the raft sank, and that boy's brother died and drowned. That could have been me. But see, God had a plan. He had a call on my life. And when you have a call of God on your life, God's not going to let anything happen to you until that call is developed. And I get a good amen. And so Paul, it wasn't meant for him to be murdered through a conspiracy. Paul had already been determined, remember by Agabus, how he told him how he was going to go to Jerusalem and how he was going to die. So his funeral was already planned, if I can say that. It was already determined by God what was going to happen. He was going to die a martyr. In other words, he was going to give up his life for the gospel. And by doing so, it was going to solidify many people's faith, even through this generation. It was going to be a testimony. We're still talking about the Apostle Paul 2,000 year, from 2,000 years ago. His legacy of what he has left behind of his Christianity still speaks today. And it gives us courage in the times of going through trials and tribulations that this gospel that was preached by the Apostle Paul is the one true gospel. Get a hallelujah, amen, something. Okay, you can, you can, you know, you can, you can feed that. Thing. And when Paul's, now look at this, verse 16. In case you didn't know, Paul had sister. And when Paul's sister's son heard of their lying in wait, I always told you, the devil has a plot, but God has a plan. What the devil thinks he's going to perform, God will outperform him. Hallelujah. I'm going to say that again because I felt the anointing. Whatever the devil performs, God will outperform him. It's amazing how Paul's sister's son happened to be right at the right place at the right time to hear this conspiracy. That was against Paul. So he heard of their lying in wait to kill him, and he went and entered into the castle, and he told Paul. Verse 7. And Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, Bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he has a certain thing to tell him. You have to understand, back then you don't know who's your friend and who's not your friend, who you could trust, who you can't trust. And so this little boy, this young man, So this captain took him and he brought him unto the chief captain and said, Paul, the prisoner, called me unto him and prayed me to bring this young man unto you for he who hath something to say to you. Then the chief captain took him by the hand and went with him aside privately. In other words, this is all directed by God. Here's God outperforming the devil's plan. Hallelujah. How many believe that? How many believe that there's nothing that's going on right now in, in our earth, in society, and in time that God is not, is not only aware of, but it's still under his control? Ultimately, we know that the devil's the God of this world. We understand that, of the system and all that stuff. But God is above that. 
Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The gold and the silver is his. Everybody thinks it's theirs because they bought it. It's not God's. It's God's. And he asked them, he said, what is it that you want to tell me? And he said, the young man said to him, he said, the Jews have agreed to desire thee that thou wouldest bring down Paul tomorrow into the council as though they would inquire somewhat of him more perfectly. But do not thou yield unto them, for there lie in wait for him of them more than forty men which have bound themselves with an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready looking for a promise from thee. Not only were they going to plot to kill Paul, but they were going to drag other people into that same thing. They are going to get them involved, even without their knowledge. So the chief captain let the young man depart and charged him. Told him, he says, listen, don't you tell anybody about this. Don't tell anybody about it. Don't you tell them what you have shown me, what you've spoken to me. Now verse 23. How many know that God will use the unsaved? He will. He'll use the un- if he can use a donkey, he can use the unsaved. He'll use the unsaved to bless the saved. He'll use the unsaved to protect the saved. And he called unto him two centurions, saying, Make ready, look at this, 200 soldiers to go to Caesarea, and horsemen threescore, And ten, that's seventy. And speak, and spearmen, two hundred, at the third hour of the night. And provide them beasts that they may set Paul on and bring him safe unto Felix the governor. God had the apostle Paul. Even, he was, even though he was traveling on the, the road to his death, because he ultimately was going to be killed. But in the process of that, God was still using the Apostle Paul. He was still using him and forming some of the letters of the New Testament. He was still using him in some people's lives by witnessing to them. And we'll get to that, in a, uh, how he witnessed to Felix. And verse 25 says, And he wrote a letter after this manner. Claudius Lysias, unto the most excellent governor Felix, sendeth greeting. This man was taken of the Jews, and should have been killed of them. Then came I with an army and rescued him, having understood that he was a Roman. Now, some people say, see, now, if Paul didn't confess that he was a Roman citizen, he would have got out of where he was before. No. He may have gotten out of that, but he would have never gotten out of this. Because when he appealed to Caesar, and they they said, remember they were going to beat him? And he said, oh, you're going to do this to a Roman, a fellow Roman? And they all got all messed up. They were like, oh, no, he's Roman. We can't do this. He said, will you, will you? Were you a free man because you paid for it? Remember, we talked about that. He said, no, I was born free. Wow, that was the highest class. So now, he says, I found out he was a Roman. We can't allow that to happen to a Roman. And when I would have known the cause where they accused him, I brought him forth into their council, whom I perceived to be a Accused of questions of their law, 
but to have nothing laid to his charge worthy of death or of bonds. You've got an unsaved person here defending the Apostle Paul. A person in leadership defending the Apostle Paul. Sometimes God will use the unsaved in leadership, whether it be a governor, a mayor, a councilman, a police officer, somebody in authority. So don't rule it out. If someone wants to come and help you during a time of trouble, and you say, well, they're not a Christian. It shouldn't matter. And when it was told me how that the Jews had laid for this man, laid in wait for this man, I am I sent straightway to thee and gave commandment to his accusers also to say before thee that they had against him farewell. Then the soldiers, as it was commanded them, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. On the morrow they left the horsemen to go with him and return to the castle, who when they came to Caesarea and delivered the epistle to the governor, presented Paul also before him. And when the governor had read the letter, he asked of what province he was, and when he understood that he was of Caesarea, he says, I will hear thee, said he, when thine accusers are also come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's judgment hall. So he wanted to hear the other side of the story. He was getting ready. He wanted the Jews to come and present their case against this Roman citizen, Paul. In chapter 24, verse 1, it says, And after five days, Ananias, the high priest, descended with the elders and with a certain orator named Tertullus, who informed the governor against Paul. And when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness, that, and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence. He's, he's flattering him now. <coughs> it's amazing how people will flatter people to get them to do what they want them to do. Notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee, see, he's still lifting this guy up, he says, that thou wouldest bear us of thy clemency a few words. For we have found this man a pestilence. He's a pestilence. He's a bother. He's making trouble. He's stirring up things. Why? He's just speaking the gospel. Telling them that Jesus is the Messiah. That the promise of the fathers of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and all of the Old Testament prophets and writers, they all spoke of Jesus. And he's saying, I found him. And I want to share it with you. It's good news. For we have found this man a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition, causing division. causing problems to our nation, to our, to our religion. Among all the Jews, that's a lie. It wasn't among all the Jews, it was among some of the Jews. But a lot of the Jews were being converted to Christianity. He says, among all the Jews throughout the world, and that was the, the world that they knew. It would mean the entire globe. There was no way of knowing that. There was no communications. There was no telecommunications. There was no cell phones. There was, <laughs> there was no Facebook. There was no uh, internet system. There was no television. There was no radio. So that was impossible to know 
about the whole world. So the only world that they could know was the world that they were involved in, the Roman provinces of their time. And he's a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene. He's a ringleader. He's a gang member. The Apostle Paul is a ringleader. He's of the mafia. Painting a pretty grim picture, isn't it? Who also hath gone about to profane the temple whom we took and would have judged according to our law. But the chief captain, Lysias, came upon us and with great violence took him away out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come unto thee by examining of whom thyself mayest take knowledge of all these things where we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. <coughs> now remember, now remember this. You may have all the facts about something and still not have the truth. You can have all the factual information and not have the truth. You believe that? Yeah, but we got the facts right here. Here's all the facts right here. No, it doesn't mean it's true. You see that so many times when a news, a news program on television will show you a, a news clip, maybe 10 seconds, and you view that 10 second clip, and if you view only by that 10 second clip, you say the person was guilty. But if you view the 30 seconds before that 10 clip and the 30 seconds after that clip, you would see he was innocent. Just like Joseph was Potiphar's right hand man, he was second in command, okay, in Potiphar's house. Potiphar had to go away on some business. And Potiphar's wife was always trying to get Joseph to have relations with her. One day, she calls him into her, her bed chambers. He knocks on her door. She says, come in. He goes in, talking with her. All of a sudden, she turns the conversation into a seductive conversation. He's like, I can't do that. How can I do that to my master? I can't do that. And then she reaches out and says, come on, lay with me. And she grabs hold of his coat. Well, he struggles and he gets out and he leaves his coat behind. He wanted out of there, so he ran out of there. She starts yelling and screaming, yelling and screaming. The people start coming in. They see Joseph running out. Those are facts, right? Joseph's running out. She's screaming. Joseph's running out. They come running in. She said, Joseph tried to rape me. See, I have his coat right here in my hand. It was on my bed. You saw it. He came in here and he tried to lay with me. So when Potiphar comes home, guess what? She tells him he throws him in jail for two years. So you had the facts, the coat in her hand, the screaming, him leaving you running, but they didn't have the truth. So be careful before you judge something and you think you have all the facts. You see what happened in Ferguson. Just because one person said he had his hands up, one person, his friend, said he had his hands up, all of a sudden, the whole movement starts based on a lie. Because after when they interviewed, black, white, whatever, 
They interviewed those people. They said he did not have his hands up. But they still believe a lie. They think some kind of these white people and black people that saw it, they were witnesses there. They saw it. They interviewed him without bias. And they said he did not have his hands up. But people will believe a lie. You can give them the truth. I'm sure that Joseph told the truth. He was factual and said, I, she wanted to lay with me. I ran out. She, no. Well, if that was the case, then why, why did she scream? If that was the case, why did you run? See? So they build a case on something like that. You've got to be careful not to assume. You know what happens when you assume? I won't say it. Then Paul, after that, the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. Sometimes the greatest defense is in a lawyer. Sometimes it's just you telling the truth. Because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship. And they, neither found, and they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues or in the city. Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. What he's saying here is I'm believing the truth. I'm, what I'm, I'm, I'm not causing dissension. I'm going and I'm, I'm believing the very things that you're hoping, they were hoping for. They're hoping for the Messiah to come. They're, they want the Messiah to come. They want the promises of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob fulfilled. They want the promises of Moses and the prophets. And guess what? He's there telling them, I found that answer to, the, to, to, your, to, your, to your hope. His name is Jesus. And he says in verse 15, And have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Now after many years I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings, whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither were multitude nor with turmoil, who ought to have been here before thee and object if they had ought against me. So he's saying, I have witnesses that were there in the temple with me. And if there was anything wrong, they, sh they would have came and be been a witness too, but they're not there. Because he says, I did nothing wrong. Or else let these say here, uh, or, or let, else let these here, same here say, if they have found my, any evil doing in me while I stood before the council, Except it be for this one voice that I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question by you this day. Remember because some of the, some were Sadducees and they don't believe in the resurrection? And the angels? And that infuriated them and it caused a whole stirring going on, remember? We talked about that. And when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of the, that way, meaning Christianity, he defended them and said, When Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. And he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty.
And this is when Paul was in prison. He was, he was, he was able to have visitors. And that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or come to him. So he was under house arrest, but he was able to have visitors. He was able to have his brethren come. If he needed any kind of uh, supplies, paper, or anything, pens to write with, or whatever he had, wills to write with, whatever he had to do, he, they were free to come and visit. Or he was able to go probably out to certain places, but not without body, uh, bodyguards. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now we're starting to, uh, now, now the vision is starting to unfold a little bit. Now the purpose of God is starting to unfold a little bit. You understand why God didn't allow Paul to be killed by the conspiracy of those guys. Felix has to be reached. The governor has to be reached. And so God has given favor to the Apostle Paul now, even though he's going through some hard circumstances, some difficult situations in his life, but God has given him favor with the governor. And now the governor is calling for him because he wants to know more about Christianity. Remember now, his wife is a Jew. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix, what? He trembled. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He began to tremble. That's telling me that he was under conviction. And I want you to understand, conviction is not repentance. Conviction is not conversion. You can come under conviction and not repent. You can come under conviction and not be saved. You can be convicted for that one moment. Look what happened in 9-11. When 9-11 hit that morning, I'll never forget it. We are watching something today that was talking about 9-11. I asked Linda, I said, do you still remember where you were? She said, yep, I was having my eye exam. I was at work operating an auto pad machine. I knew exactly where I was. I remember this little speaker up in the corner. I remember the words coming out of that speaker. You all remember where you were in 9-11? Here the Apostle Paul is talking, he's telling him about Christ. And he's bringing him to a place of conviction to the point where he's, tr where he's trembling. It's visible because Paul saw it. And he answered Paul, and he says, Go thy way for this time. When I have convenient season, I will call for thee. In other words, what he was saying here is, I want to think about it. He hoped also, look at this. He hoped also that money should have been given to him of Paul. He wanted a bribe. So you see that even though he trembled under God, God's word, his motivating factor or his hidden motive was he wanted more money. And if Paul would have probably gave him money, he would have ruled in his favor. But God didn't even allow that. But can I tell you that it's sad that some Christians would have paid the, paid the uh, bribe. I've seen it in India. I've seen it in Nigeria. 
When I was in Nigeria, one of the uh, custom agents wanted me to give him money. I said, no, I'm not doing that. Now, he could have held me up and do what, you know, held me back. I could have missed my plane, whatever, but no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not, you're not, I'm not going to give you money. You want to bribe. It's terrible. He hoped that that money which should be given to him of Paul, that he might lose him. Wherefore he sent for him the oftener and commanded with him, and communed with him, I'm sorry. So in other words, it was more than one time he offered that to Paul. Hey, give me some money, I'll let you go. Some people would interpret that as, wow, see, God opened the door. And all I got to do is give him money and I can go. Here's my deliverance. No. I told you this before. Integrity is, and character is what you do in private. Your image is what you project publicly. But your character and your integrity is who you are in private. What you speak, what you do, what you think in private. About a situation, your, your family, politics, your home, church, pastor, whatever it is. Your image is what people see. Your integrity and your character is who you are privately. And the both should act, equal each other. Your, in other words, your image should come out of what you are privately. I think the world calls it two-faced. But after two years... Crossius Fistus came unto Felix's room, and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. So he was bound there, and he was in prison for quite a while. Two years. But you know what else happened after that, during that time? Think about it. Paul began to write letters. You have you have those in your lap right now. Right on the chair, you have those letters. Those very same letters that Paul did in different, different imprisonments that he had. Chapter 25. And when Festus was coming to the province after three days, he, ascri he ascended from Caesarea to Jerusalem. And then the high priest and the chief of the Jews informed him against Paul and besought him. And he desired favor against him that he would send for him to Jerusalem, laying in wait in the way to kill him. There's another plot. They were going to plot to kill him now in Jerusalem, on the way to Jerusalem. But Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea, and that he himself would depart shortly thither. Let them therefore, said he, which... Among you are able, go down with me and accuse this man if there be any wickedness in him. And when he had tarried among them more than ten days, he went down unto Caesarea, and the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, commanded Paul to be brought. And when he was come, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem stood round about and laid many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not. prove it. There was a story of a man who was found guilty of a crime. There were ten witnesses that saw him. It was, it was legitimate. They saw him do this crime. And he told the judge, he said, Your Honor, I can, I can bring 50 people here that didn't see me do it. And he could have. All the lawyer had to do was get 50 people that weren't there. Get them on the stand one by one and say, did you see this man kill that man? No. Bring all 50 of them. It's what's called a straw man argument. There's no substance to it. Just because you have 50 people that didn't see you do it didn't mean you didn't do it. They weren't even there. Of course they didn't see it. 
So here, they're trying to stir up again and saying that they're going to try to prove something, but they could not prove it. They had complaints, but they could not prove it. While he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, neither against the temple, nor yet against Caesar, have I offended anything at all. <clears throat> but verse 9. But Festus willing to do the Jews a pleasure. Who was Felix's wife? Um, um, Festus, rather. Who was Festus's wife? I'm sorry, who was Felix's wife? She was Jewish, right? Who had influence. Okay, and now Festus is, was willing to do Jews a pleasure, answered Paul and said, Will thou go up to Jerusalem and there be judged of these things before me? Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat. He's Again, he's appealing to Rome. He's appealing to Caesar. Because he knows the Jews are going to kill him. Okay, He knows there's a conspiracy. He knows they want him dead. He's a Roman citizen. He has every right to appeal like we would appeal to the Supreme Court. Like, you know, they... First and foremost, I believe that this ban on this travel ban should have never gone to the, the lower courts. The courts do not have the power to tell the president what he can and cannot do. <clears throat> the Supreme Court, when he appeared to he appealed it to the Supreme Court, they agreed with him in part because they changed a few of the wordings of it, but they kept most of it in place. So he appeals to Caesar. Wherefore, he says, I ought to be judged to the Jews. I have done no wrong, as thou very well know. For if I be an offender or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things whereof they accuse me of, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. Once he does that, the, the appeal is in, in motion. He's now appealing like we would appeal to the you know, Supreme Court. You have to wait. You can't do anything. No other judgment can be made until it's, until it's heard. Then Festus, when he had offered with the council, answered, Hast thou appealed unto Caesar? He says, Unto Caesar thou shalt go. We have time. I can, uh. And after certain days, King Agrippa and Bernice came unto Caesarea to salute Festus. And when they had been there many days, Festus declared Paul's cause unto the king, saying, There is a certain man left in bonds by Felix. About And when they had been there many days, Festus declared Paul's cause to the king, saying, There is a certain man left in bonds by Felix, about whom when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me, desiring to have judgment against him, to whom I answered, It is not the manner of the Romans to deliver any man to die, before that he which is accused have accusers face to face and have license to answer for himself concerning the crime laid against him. Therefore, when they were come hither without any delay on the morrow, I sat on judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought forth. So he's giving up. He's reiterating what he's already been saying. Therefore, when they were one hither, hither without any delay on the morrow, I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the, the man to be brought forth. Against whom, when the accusers stood up, they brought none an accusation of such things as I supposed but had certain questions against him of their own superstition and of one Jesus, which was dead, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. <laughs> Hallelujah. So they're getting a message. That's infuriating a lot of the Jews, by the way. And because I doubted of such manner of questions, I asked him whether he would go to Jerusalem and there be judged of these matters. But when Paul had appealed to be reserved unto the hearing of Augustus, I commanded him to be
kept till I might send him to Caesar. And he says, Then Agrippa said unto Festus, I would also bear the man myself. Tomorrow, said he, Thou shalt hear him. And on the morrow, when Agrippa was come to Bernice with great pomp, and was entered into the place of hearing with the chief captains and principal men of the city at Festus' command, Paul was brought forth. And Festus said, King Agrippa, and all men which are here present with us, you see this man about whom all the multitude of the Jews have dealt with me both at Jerusalem and also here, crying that he ought not to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I have determined to send him, of whom I have no certain thing to write unto my Lord, wherefore I have brought him forth before you, and especially before thee, O King Agrippa, after that examination, that I might have somewhat to write, for it seemed to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not with her to signify the crimes laid against him. So what I'll probably do is I'll probably stop here uh, so we can continue on channel, um, chapter 26 and verse 1 because Paul is going to defend himself and he's going to go over some of the similar things that he already has gone over. So I don't want to kind of do that all over again. Okay, so we'll, we'll start that over again uh, and that will be pretty good because there will be some that will be missing. So that will be good. You know, we're going to kind of just go over a few things. And then we'll get back to that. Are there any questions you might have or any any uh, comments you'd like to make about what we're studying here? Do you want your favorite chapter? It's amazing how men can have all kinds of all kinds of things against you. And yet, you can stand up and God will put words in your mouth that will confound them. He'll give you wisdom to speak in time when you're, when you're, when you're, um, when you're going through something. I remember when I went to India. I don't know if it was, the, I think it was the first time I went to India. Yeah, the first time I went to India. I had brought a keyboard with me, a little Yamaha keyboard. Now, they write that in your passport. Whatever you bring, they write it in the passport. <clears throat> and so uh, I went to an orphanage, and uh, they wanted to learn music, but they didn't have an instrument. And you know me, big-hearted pastor, you know. So I said, well, I'm going to give them my keyboard. So I gave them my keyboard. And when I got to the, when I got to the airport, <clears throat> of course, I was sick besides. I was in a wheelchair. One of the custom agents said, when he opened my passport, and he saw that I didn't have my keyboard, he said, where's your keyboard? I said, I, well, I had visited an orphanage, and there was a bunch of kids, and they wanted to learn music, but they didn't have any instruments. So I gave it to them. He said, you didn't charge them money? You didn't take any money? I said, no. How could I take money? I don't have anything. It's an orphanage. So I gave it to them. Well, one of the other custom agents heard that, and he came over. He said, let me see that. He looked at it. He said, no, this man has to pay the, the tariff. He's got to pay 200 U.S. dollars. I didn't have 200 U.S. dollars. So I just started praying it myself. And so he's, he, the guy's going back and forth with him in the Indian language. I don't know what they were saying. And he's arguing with this guy, this other custom agent. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, he's got to pay, he's got to pay, he's got to pay, he's got to pay. So after they argued for about 10 minutes, he comes back. And I'm just, I'm just sitting there. I'm just praying. I said, Lord, you know why I gave this keyboard. Open up the door. He comes back to the, the booth and says to me, did this with my keyboard? Yes. Yes. God will give you favor when you speak the truth. Let me say this. A lot of times what we do is we want God to move first. Then we'll believe. We want God to do something first and then and we say, okay, God, I'm waiting on you. 
Well, you do something first, and then I'll do it. No. God's, God told the Israelites what? Put your foot in the Jordan. Yeah, but God, you separate the water first, and then I'll go. You separate the water, God, I'll know it's you, and then I'll go. No, God said, no. No. You send the, send the ark first with the priest, and you get your feet wet into that water. You put your feet in that water, then I'll work. That's what faith is. Faith isn't waiting for God to do something. Faith is taking what you believe God is saying and step out in faith. And when you step out, that's when God moves. Hallelujah. That's what you got to do. you got to also remember that God is waiting on us. We don't have to wait on him. He's waiting on us. Praise the Lord. That's all we got to do, and that's all we got to remember. When God says to do something, do it. By faith, do it. I'm sure you all have stories like that. Somewhere down the line, something has happened. And God said, go do that. Go speak to that person. If you never saw the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, you need to watch that movie. Right, with Jimmy Stewart. I think I've seen it like 15 times. I don't know. I can't count. My wife always says, you're watching that again when it comes on at Christmas time. Because it's a great story. You, gotta, you have to move out in faith. You have to believe. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. If I let fear interfere, listen to me. If I let fear interfere, with my going anywhere, I would have never gone on the mission field. I would have never traveled. I'm telling you the truth. Every time I book a flight, all I keep hearing in my ear is plane's gonna crash, plane's gonna something's gonna happen, something's gonna go wrong. And nothing's happened. You have to believe that God is with you. God's you have God's favor. Don't let fear stop you from doing what God wants you to do. Now, don't go do something stupid. Use wisdom. God says, go here. Can't figure out why. God says, go pick up that, that, that Chinese man and help him. Give him some direction. I spoke with Kevin today on Facebook. He says he still loves Jesus. All because somebody would listen to go and help. Even though it was inconvenient. We had to spend all that money on Pentecostal fire so that Tom could be here. And I think the time he came, we had the band and everything. You know? But it was worth it. So whatever God says to do it, do it. Step out in faith. Yeah, but God, I want you to use me. Well, he's not going to, he doesn't use a stone that stays in place. You've got to move. He said, occupy till I come. Go be a blessing. I know, i got to say this because I know that sometimes Louis doesn't like it when he's too busy. But sometimes when I'm there, I pray and I say, Lord, bless him. Let the business increase. Let him have more finances to help him. And then I feel guilty after because he comes and he tells me, oh, I wish this place would stop. I wish the phones would stop. I wish this would stop. He's always closing for every reason, you know. But I do. We do that. We pray for him to be blessed. He has to be blessed the way his wife spends money. It takes a lot of faith. But we want to we want to pray for them as before they go. They're going they're gonna be leaving on Saturday to Portugal and to Spain. And I I told your husband, I said, make sure you take 
take her somewhere, just the two of you, maybe on a little gondola ride or something, you know, something nice and romantic for you, to get away from your kids, get away from the parents, just go to the two of you, have a good time. Even one day, just one day out of the three weeks, whatever it is, just take one day. I also told him, I said, you know, and make sure that before you leave on Friday night, go in her pocketbook, take all her credit cards out. Keep them, keep them with you. So let's just pray for them. Can we do that? Please. Father, we thank you and we praise you, God, for Lewis and Felicia, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for their life. Thank you, Father, that you're going to bless them, Lord. Father, I pray for mercy and grace. I pray, Father, for traveling mercies. I pray, Father, that you will bless them with safe travel from wherever they take off from Boston and wherever they land in Portugal and Spain and the flying of their children. I pray, God, that you keep them safe from all harm and danger, that you save them from all aggressiveness of man. Give them favor, Lord. When they ask for directions for something, Father, lead somebody in their direction, Father, to help them. God, we thank you for their life. We thank you, Father, for their friendship. We thank you for their love. Now, Father, bless their time as they rest, as they visit family. I pray that you make a, a bond with the family. Lord, bring them home safe. Keep them safe while they're there in the streets. Let no harm or danger come near them, Father. We thank you and we praise you. Till we see them again, safely here again. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you tonight.